hello at the end of the last class we made a list of uh, a few applications of uh, sprays and what we are going to do today is sort of zoom out a little bit and look at spray as a as an entity spray is a collection of about a million billion maybe even a trillion drops okay and uh, we want to see what sort of measures can i bring to a spray to gain a quantitative understanding of a spray okay so we'll start to make a list of a few different spray characteristics now before we turn to the audience and try to ask this question of them i want to suggest that there are basically two kinds of spray characteristics one that are uh, macroscopic in nature and a second that is microscopic okay so we'll make a list of a few different macroscopic qualities first and then move on to the microscopic qualities uh, we will just take a steady spray so as opposed to a little perfume spray perfume spray is where you push the plunger down a whiff of perfume comes out there is a start and an end to it okay so we are going to talk about a spray that has no start and an end okay but it is just like a continuous perfume spray it is just easier to understand these qualitative aspects in that context and then we'll talk about uh, 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 an intermittent spray uh, also and talk of some qualities of an intermittent spray as well okay so let's start listing a few different macroscopic qualities okay so we'll just say spread or span of the spray spray angle spray angle very nice okay i'll also distinguish this between this and cone angle okay we'll talk about that also penetration length droplet size okay we are going to list this in the i will distinguish this because this is going to occur in both the macroscopic and the microscopic list okay so we will we will talk about talk of this in just a moment macroscopic measure okay any others that we want to include so this droplet velocity velocity so we will just say velocity as a again a macroscopic measure okay so th we've already made a list of a few different things here the so and i want to add one to it which is uh, one that is relevant to many different processes actual mass flow rate of the liquid we can add a few more but this is a good enough list okay so if i just take a typical spray let's say i have a spray nozzle from which i have the spray emanating now first of all i have this all these drops in the spray we've seen this uh, many times the actual flow rate coming out in a steady sense is the liquid uh, mass of the liquid flowing out per second okay this is relevant to surely many applications okay now talk of velocity there are two kinds of velocities okay the reason i wrote down macroscopic measure is because i want to know sort of in a bulk so if i take a whole bulk of this spray 
what is like a velocity vector of that bulk. Okay, but really speaking it is not of use to know what this whole bulk is doing. I want to know what a what different points in the spray are doing. Okay. So, therefore, there is a need to understand sprays using microscopic measures. Back to the mic microscopic I just want to complete the list here spread or span like for example, that width at a target surface say for example, if you are spray painting a wall I have the paint can about let us say 10 inches away from the wall when I push the plunger and this is a continuous spray because I can just walk along the wall and paint the wall. When I am walking along the wall there is a certain width that the paint uh, impact will cover that is important because I want to know how many passes I have to make of this can. So, if I look at uh, a measure like that that gives me a width and clearly that is also tied to the cone angle or the spray angle. So, there are two kinds of angles and we will talk about them maybe about a week from now, but essentially if I call that angle 2 theta, 2 theta is what we will call the spray angle. The cone angle is slightly different we will look at that in some detail in the sense that the angle very close to the nozzle here would be slightly different for, for different fluid mechanic reasons and that is often referred to as the cone angle. So, you have a cone angle that is usually larger than your spray angle. penetration length. Now, again some of these measures are all tied to each other because if I take a, a, a spray of a certain mass flow rate and somehow increase the width which also means increase the spray angle, I am naturally going to decrease the penetration length because the drops on sort of the mass of drops are going to slow down. So, the penetration length is a measure of of that. All right, so let us put this intuition to work we will look at a little video we made in this in our lab here. This is a simple perfume spray that is going to go from start to end. Okay, so, let us play this video and see what we learn from it. I want to pause it there to, to point to a few different things you look at you look at that angle there that is what the that is the spray angle. Now, as you go further downstream you can see that the spray angle is becomes less and less defined. So, as I go further and further downstream the spray angle becomes less and less defined because there is no spray edge the idea of a spray edge is an illusion it is not like the edge of this pen it is well the edge of a pen is well defined the edge of a spray has to be defined by us and our definition of the spray edge is going to also influence our definition of the spray angle. So, if I say I want to go as far as I find no drop at all that is going to give me an almost 180 degree cone angle in many different sprays it is going to be a very large number in comparison to where I said I am going to go to a point where the mass flow rate drops below some critical value. So, mass flux okay, that is the rate of mass flow per unit area drops below a certain value. So, I will say okay, when there is very very few drops almost a mist I am not going to count that in my spray that is a simple definition of a spray edge. We can find more quantitative definitions as well, but our idea of a spray angle is clearly tied to that. Okay. All right. So, here let us go on and continue to play this video I want you to understand two or three different aspects here uh, you can see that there are some big white flashes right where my mouse is pointing. Okay, those are in a sense big drops so I can go back to the start and show you where they started you see that that drop there that started is going to continue forward. I want you to notice two differences here one of course, this is not a steady spray, 
but this idea also applies to a steady spray. So, the the concept of having big drops alongside tiny multi tiny drops is not something that is uh, uh, out of the ordinary. Every spray of any commercial interest will have a range of drops uh, that the spray has. So, typically the range is you is on the order of at least two or it is at least two orders of magnitude in span more often it is three orders of magnitude in span. So, the idea that you have drops that are ranging from nearly uh, let us say a fraction of a micron of micrometer in diameter to hundreds of micrometers in diameter is not at all out of the ordinary. In fact, you can see this in this image ok. Now, as you keep going you can see that the perfume has has practically stagnated around and uh, there is not much movement of the drops past that point. So, you spray and the spray goes into air and sort of the drops reach uh, due to the drag from the surrounding air they sort of equilibrate they may continue to move forward by momentum conservation, but it is diffused uh, quite a bit. So, your spray width starts to increase as you go far downstream. Okay. So, now when I look when I go back and look at that like I said there are many different uh, microscopic properties that are actually more important uh, and relevant to a spray. Like for example, at every point we said you are going to have a drop size distribution. So, I said point, but we will qualify that in just a moment. The idea that a spray is composed of several sizes of drops, okay, this is sort of obvious to us by now. Not just that, that there is also a velocity distribution, okay, again I will qualify this. to clearly distinguish it from the air around ok. We are looking at a droplet velocity distribution. So, you have drop size distribution and droplet velocity distribution that are all microscopic properties. So, these are now like I am looking at the individual droplet level I am almost looking at somehow understanding the spray from within as opposed to from without from outside ok. What other microscopic properties can I list here? Uh, I can look at uh, in a typical spray like a perfume spray we looked at this yesterday as well uh, in the last class we are interested in like a rate of evaporation or temperature dependence which is clearly temperature dependent. Okay. So, from there I can say somehow uh, I am also there is also this idea that there is a droplet temperature distribution ok. So, these are all in some sense individual variables like a drop a single drop has a size it has a velocity and it has a temperature these are all at the droplet level they are properties that you can assign to a single drop. Now, at the spray level what do I how do I convert this droplet level information into a spray level information ok. There are two ways of doing it one I do this I do just this. So, I sit here play this video or I have a spray like this going. I pause ok. I, I pause the picture and then look at all the drops in this frame 
Now this particular video is not particularly good to zoom in and zoom out although you could to some extent it is not quantitative but clearly that is just a question of camera resolution. So if I have a sufficiently high resolution camera and these are not out of the ordinary also I can pretty much image every drop in this frame right now okay? and from the image of every drop I can reconstruct the size of every drop. So let us say we did this calculation last time there are approximately a million drops in this picture right now probably slightly less than a million. I can image every drop get a size and get million numbers okay. from that I can construct a histogram of what to do with this. So once I go to the uh, million drops in the picture so sample so let us first pose our question and then we will answer what is drop size distribution. So I want to understand what is a, what do I really quantitatively mean by drop size distribution and how do I measure it that is what I want to get to. We will spend quite a bit of time on this how do I measure it thing but I want to first start with what is drop size distribution and then that will naturally lead us into how do I measure it. If I so I can take a freeze frame count every drop in the frame and measure its size okay. This will uh, give us essentially like a million numbers or slightly less than a million numbers and from there I can construct a histogram we are all familiar with the concept of a histogram okay. I want to spend some time on that because it is there is some very important uh, mathematical tools that we need to acquire to completely understand what a real histogram and what we can do with a histogram. Okay. So let us say I do this histogram and it gives me something like this. So this is diameter and this is count. I can get the count versus diameter <coughs> of every drop in this frame and that will give me a distribution okay. clearly this is a drop size distribution in the spray. This kind of an information is what we will call spatial drop size distribution because my independent coordinate of acquiring this information was x and y the space. <coughs> Another way of thinking at it is thinking about this is for every drop that I uh, that I capture or count in the freeze frame. I can also get its x and y coordinates okay. So that, all, that automatically means I am in the process of acquiring the uh, spatial drop size distribution because those x and y coordinates would be different for different drops okay. Another way of getting the same drop size distribution is to sit at a point in the spray. So look at where my cursor is I will sit at that point in the spray and I have a way of just you know sitting in a lawn chair and counting every drop that is going by me okay. So I am not moving in spatial coordinate I am just sitting at that one point and acquiring information of the droplet size, droplet velocity, droplet temperature if I want to really get specific about the spray of every, every single drop going by me. 
okay. So, let us let us look at that another way of doing the same thing So, I can look at every drop in the spray that is going by me and get its drop size velocity in this case it could be a vector it could be both a x and y coordinate and temperature if I really want to get fancy of every drop. Now, the independent coordinate that distinguishes different drops here is the time of arrival. There are succession of drops coming through. So, every drop is going to have a different time stamp of when it arrived at my location okay. as opposed to the previous way of sampling drop size distributions where I had a the distinguishing feature it was a x and y coordinate of the drop okay. So, I can now take this same let us say I sit there for 10 seconds and in 10 seconds like you know typical perfume whiff is like let us say 2 seconds and in 2 seconds I was able to sample let us say again a, a fraction of a million drops and I have now statistics of size velocity of every drop coming through them. So, I will just for now ignore the other quantities and look at only the size to sort of illustrate the point. So, I can now do the same histogram. I will get again the independent coordinate of this histogram is the same I am counting the number of drops in a certain bin ok. Now, this distribution is what we will call the temporal drop size distribution. Okay. So, we started to talk of microscopic measures of which drop size distribution is one measure and when we when we listed this here it was actually a fairly simple thing to list you know there is different size drops we want to understand some information about the size drops. We quickly found out that there is not one, but there is two different drop size distributions now we are left in a limbo ok are they the same or under what conditions can we expect them to be the same under what conditions will they be totally different because they contain different pieces of information ok. So, before we completely understand under what conditions are they the same and under what conditions are they different ok. I want to sort of make the equivalence between these two ways of sampling the same problem say sampling the same physical system you are essentially measuring something about a physical system. There are two ways of understanding any physical system ok. One is what is called a random field approach.
especially a statistical system like a spray that is like some sort of an uncertainty some sort of a uh, you are you have to resort to probabilistic measures at some point and under those situations there are two ways of doing it either a random field approach or what is called a point process approach. We will talk about this in some detail, but I want to sort of draw the equivalence between a field approach that is where I am looking at a spatial distribution of some quantity and a temporal distribution of the of another quantity as being two completely different ways of looking at the same system. So, in general we do not expect them to be the same, they are completely different. Okay. Under what I will present one simple situation under which they will exactly be the same. So, if I say for example, when are the The same is a very restrictive criteria. Okay, I want to start with that because it is the easiest to understand. They are exactly the same. <coughs> when you do two things, one if I take a spray and in this case I cannot do a spray like a usual spray, I take drops in a box. So, this is a box that has all these drops in it, let me not let me not clutter the box with it. Okay, there are different size drops. If every drop in this box was moving to my right with exactly the same velocity. Okay, so, th all the drops are moving to my right with exactly the same velocity. Then if I had a way of staying at this location I will call this x x sample drops So, I am not sampling drops at a point, but I am sampling drops passing through a certain cross sectional area and this is also possible measurable and quite routinely done. So, if I am able to sample drops passing through a certain cross section and I and I construct a drop size distribution from the sampling at a certain cross section, this is like my temporal drop size distribution. And if all the drops were moving with exactly the same velocity, okay, then essentially in the time, let us say if the width of this box was some delta, delta divided by u is the time is the time taken for all the drops to pass through my cross section. So, whether I take a snapshot at some time t equal to 0 of this box or and, and then construct a spatial drop size distribution from all the drops in that box or whether I sit at location x x and sample all the drops come through that, uh, that cross section and then construct the same distribution I will get exactly the same answers. Okay. So, really speaking there are two assumptions I made not one, one assumption is that all the drops are moving with the same velocity. Okay. I want to I showed you where I am going to show you where I cheated you into another assumption. Okay. So, one assumption
the second assumption is this let us say this box is my frame correct this is the frame that i used to construct my uh, image frame that i used to construct my spatial drop size distribution and then i am sampling for a certain time t capital t that is going to tell me the time over which i can sample to get the temporal drop size distribution okay so if delta is the width of this frame and capital t is the time of sampling it is only when capital t is exactly equal to delta divided by u that i get this if i choose capital t to be some other number other than delta divided by u let us take the simplest situation where capital t is less than delta divided by u okay what happens if capital t is less than delta divided by u i would have only sampled a part of this frame i would not have sampled the other half of the frame or other part of the frame which means now is there a guarantee that the drop size distribution i construct from half the frame is the same as the drop size distribution in the full frame there is no guarantee i could have had a completely different mix of drops in the back half of the frame i don't know that right so this criteria that capital t has to exactly be equal to delta divided by u so in other words if you made a freeze frame uh, of a spray and you reconstructed a drop size distribution even if all the drops were moving with the same velocity i i am constrained to sample at this capital t only to get the exact same distribution which is again very restrictive so t has to be exactly equal to delta divided by u this is not so obvious okay now clearly the first assumption and the second assumption are different in the basic philosophy one assumption number 1 i have no control over what actually happens in the spray all drops have to move at the same velocity i don't get to control that but the second is second looks more like a measurement thing okay the second looks more like so even if all drops are moving with approximately the same velocity can i make this equivalence the only way to make that equivalence is if somehow even if you make spatial drop size distribution measurements with some delta i make with another t okay i don't know what delta you used but i make it with some, with some other t what sort of delta and t will give me approximately the same information okay or at least on what sort of delta and t relationship will give me information will will allow the two kinds of distributions to tend towards each other the answer to that is as i keep making my delta larger and larger so your initial spatial size distribution is composed of a very large frame and you had enough resolution to actually size every drop in the spray and then i can take a time sampling that is also very large so i can sit there forever and ever and ever and then sample all the drops so if you if delta became infinitely large and t was also infinitely large so all i need to know is then they are going to be approximately the same given that the drops are all moving with the same velocity okay so essentially the second criteria is a is an artifact of the idea that we are constrained with finite domain sampling and finite time sampling Okay, the fact that i cannot sit there and measure forever and ever i have to do my sampling in a finite time likewise my camera cannot zoom out to the entire region of the spray i am only constrained to a small part of the spray so these are the uh, sort of the assumptions th that underlie the equivalence between the spatial and the 
temporal drop size distributions. Now, what about velocity? Let us talk a little bit about velocity as well and then we will move on to uh, the third part. So, we will look at what velocity distribution is. Again, if I go back to my image, I can pause the image, I can Okay, this is a paused image, I can take another freeze frame just like this a short time thereafter and use some fairly simple algorithm simple or sophisticated to find the displacement of a drop. Okay. So, it is like we are going to get into this in some detail towards the end when we talk of measurement techniques, but essentially I can image a drop, image a set of drops now and a short time later and from those two images I can reconstruct a velocity field. Okay. So, one way is take images a small time apart Another way of doing the same thing, see how this is equivalent to the spatial information. What distinguishes every particle here is its original x and y coordinate in the image. So, if the original x and y coordinates are of every particle in this fr in the original frame are different like we started to do with like we uh, discussed with the drop size distribution. The second way of doing it is exactly like the previous temporal size distribution which is I sit at one point and measure the velocity of every point coming through every drop coming uh, by me. Okay, so, I can sample the second way So, these are two different ways again like we discussed with drop size distribution it is not obvious that they have to be the same. In fact, in the case of velocity there is no reason to even believe that they will be the same because drops at different points are different. So, in other words I cannot even start to ask the question under what conditions will these two be the same because they are two completely piece different pieces of information. Temperature and other like we discussed towards the end of the class last time we talked of concentration as being a parameter that qualifies each drop. So, if I have a fuel that I am spraying that has multiple components concentration of a certain component in a in a given single drop is a measure is a scalar measure that is associated with that drop it is like a scalar property not a measure scalar property associated with that drop. So, I can have this temperature is also another scalar property associated with the drop vector is a uh, velocity is a vector property associated with the drop, size is a scalar property. I can get into lists of vector and scalar properties associated with these drops, but the point is all of those properties can be measured in a spatial sense or in a temporal sense. Okay. Now, the basic requirement for equivalence between these two is that we will only focus on the first one that all drops have to be move, moving with 
approximately the same velocity if not exactly the same velocity. That principle is very often violated in a real spray and therefore, these two measures are completely different and that violation is quantified in terms of what is called as size velocity correlation. Correlation the word has a meaning that there is somehow there is a if not a causality meaning somehow there is there is a sense that a certain size drops can be expected to move with a certain velocity that is known a priori ok that is the idea of a correlation. So, I can uh, now take this spray for example and when I play it you can see in here that the larger drops for example right in the middle here are moving with a slightly higher velocity compared to the smaller drop at exactly the same spatial location or very nearly the same spatial location. So, at least as far as this spray is concerned larger drops are moving with a higher velocity in comparison to the smaller drops and that is basically information that I can take to if I measure that in this perfume spray I can transport that information to another perfume spray that is somewhat similar in construction and I can apply this information to other processes as well where even if the nozzle design was not the same fluid mechanically if they were similar then larger drops in that other spray can also be expected to move with a, a higher velocity in comparison to the smaller drops. And in, in general in many many different sprays spanning many different nozzle designs at any given point the large drops will tend to be moving slightly faster than the smaller drops on average ok. So, this is the idea that this is a very important word because I cannot I cannot draw any conclusion on any two given pairs of drops. If I give you two drops at a particular point <coughs> and ask you the question is the larger drop moving faster can you for sure predict if the larger drop is going to move faster you cannot make that prediction all you can say is on average in a fairly large sample of similar drops similar large drops similar small drops the similar set of large drops is expected to move slightly faster than the similar set of small drops that is the only prediction you can make and that is the only idea that you can take away from a size velocity correlation. Now, <coughs> all of the measures that we talked about all of the spray characteristics both macroscopic and microscopic that we listed thus far are only sort of uh, steady spray characteristics. So, these are we have discussed them thus far in the context of a spray that has no beginning and end in time and that is relatively unchanged in time. So, let us sort of make sure we completely understand what we mean by steady because it is a very important uh, you know we, we, we say we are making the steady flow assumption all the time. <coughs> let us understand what we mean exactly by that word steady spray in the next few minutes. Let us take the spatial distribution as our as our means of understanding steadiness. So, I take a picture 
and I have reconstructed this drop size distribution. I take a second image and uh, a short time later, let us say um, uh, one second later and these two images are exactly alike. Okay. Now, uh, they clearly they would not be exactly alike, all I have to say is they are alike. So, without going into the microscopic detail of which drop is at which x and y location in the image, if I can take two frames okay, that I took some time later and I am unable to tell which one was taken first. So, the time stamp, the time stamp is indistinguishable, the time stamp is not encoded into the picture itself, that is the case of a steady spray. Okay. So, if I go back to my old uh, high speed video, if I took this picture and then this picture, the first image had the spray only about that far, the second image has a spray almost further downstream, that is the nature of how a perfume spray works. This is the cle a clear case of violation of my steady definition, but if I drag this further down into my high speed video and now play it, I took this image or I will go back. Okay. I took this image and then another image a short time later. Now, this is still a transient spray as far as my eye is concerned, I mean there is a start and an end but there was a time in the middle say about one second when I could not tell two images that came a hundred milliseconds apart. Okay, so, these in that time span there was a time span in the case of a perfume spray when I can treat the spray to be relatively steady. Okay. So, our basic definition of steady okay, for for the case of this class okay, is that I if I take two pictures of a spray and I cannot from all macroscopic measurements. Okay, I am starting off with a less, uh, less constrictive criteria first and then we will talk of the microscopic case. I cannot tell which one came first, okay, then I am beginning to make the case that they are steady. Then if I make microscopic measurements of the drop size distribution. So, I am now recovering the statistics of the spray be it temporal or spatial. If I can still claim that I cannot tell the difference as to which one came first or which one came next from the microscopic measurements of distributions, I am still ok, I can still call it a steady spray. When I can begin to tell the difference like the first example we saw with the startup, I can from a macroscopic measurement of a penetration length tell you that they are not the same, I can tell which one came first. So, that is not the that is a clearly unsteady spray. So, if you take a clear case like a diesel engine where you have your injector operating a few hundred times a second, can I treat, can I use any information from all this literature concerning steady sprays for diesel sprays, the answer is yes. The answer is pick up the time window where you cannot tell the difference and there is a time window as long as you restrict uh, the application of these models to describing the spray in that time window you are doing quite okay. okay. So, just as a quick recap we talked of different measures or different characteristics of spray. And then we talked of spatial versus temporal measurements and the equivalence thereof. Okay. And then finally, <coughs> we made the case for a steady, what do we mean by steady? We will continue this discussion in the next class.